Section 7.13, Synthetic Strategy. So the whole point of organic synthesis is to find ways to make valuable and complex compounds from something that's cheap and readily available um, and to us. So something that's valuable and complex could be a synthetic fiber or maybe a drug. And it says here that you know how to make a variety of compounds starting with an alkyl halide. So if I start with a primary alkyl halide, so this is a primary alkyl bromide in this case, it could be an iodide or a chloride. And then again, we could think of a tosylate or a mesylate or a triflate as being uh, similar in reactivity to a primary halide. I'm not going to go over all of these reactions because I've gone over a lot of these extensively, except for a couple of them that I want to cover. So the first one I want to talk about is this one here. So this is using sodium cyanide. So sodium cyanide. So cyanide isn't a very strong base, um, uh, but it is an okay nucleophile. So it can be used to do an SN2 reaction to give you a nitrile. And you should know the functional group, a nitrile. So when I have the C with a triple bond N, that's a nitrile. The next one that I think you should know that I didn't cover in my lecture material is this one here, and this is called acetate. So acetate. This is actually called sodium acetate because it's the sodium salt, so you could even put here sodium, sodium acetate. But what's acting as the nucleophile is the acetate ion, and I'm actually going to draw the Lewis structure. So if I have my methyl group and then a carbonyl, then I have my, there we go the negative charge of my oxygen. So the acetate is sometimes, we refer to these as carboxylates. So they're, they're the conjugate bases of a carboxylic acid and the, the conjugate acid to acetate is acetic acid. Now we'll talk about that more later uh, in this class, but the whole point is that acetate is, can function as a nucleophile. So I can get a nucleophilic attack like this, have the loss of my leaving group, and I form an ester. So, so far we haven't seen a way to make an ester. So that's a pretty neat reaction because esters are very common in, in drugs. Um, the next one is a thiol. So I can use um, sodium um, hydrosulfide to do that, to make a thiol. I can make an ether. I can make alkenes. So you can see that I can make put a lot of different functional groups um, or, or make a lot of different functional groups by starting with an alkyl halide. Similarly, it says here with tertiary halides, it says in order to envision, in order to envision how a desired compound can be made, you need to be able to recall the reactions that you can use. That's a really polite way of saying you have to have all of these reactions memorized. So you can see here if we start in the top right, so this first reaction here, if I treat this with T-butoxide, you should recognize that that is a hindered base and therefore it's going to give you the Hoffman product. So this would be the major product in this case. Um, if I have a tosylate um, down here, and if I treat that with T-butoxide, I'm going to get the same thing. I'm going to get the Hoffman product because a tosylate can be treated in the same way that we can treat an alkyl halide. Um, also, if I use a strong base, strong nucleophile like sodium hydroxide on a tertiary alkyl halide or tosylate, I'm going to end up with the Zaitsev product in that case because I'm not going to get substitution because it's tertiary, it's too hindered but I will get elimination, and since the base is non-hindered, I will get the more stable alkene. Anyhow, again, I could spend more time on all these reactions, but they've been covered in earlier videos. <clears throat> so a little more about thinking um, on the subject of how you would make molecules. So it says here, when we think about how to make something, we first um, think about what the finished product will look like. So if you want to build a birdhouse or you know, a doghouse, you're not just going to start nailing pieces of wood together. You would actually look at, at the plan or you would look at a birdhouse and you'd say, well, how would I make this, right? That's kind of similar. So the analogy he uses in the book is a brick house. And he says, if you wanted to build a brick house, first you'd imagine what it looks like and then you'd deci start deciding what materials you would use to make that. So organic synthesis is very similar. The first thing that we're always going to do is we're going to look at the desired product and then we're going to decide, you know, what kind of substrates and what kind of reactants could we use to make this product. And we call this approach retrosynthetic analysis. And the arrow that we use is going to be new uh, to think of retrosynthetic uh, analysis is this arrow here. We use a double line and then we use an arrow like this. So this is sometimes we call this the, the retro, the retrosynthesis arrow. 
there we go, the retrosynthesis arrow. So let's say we wanted to make an ether, okay? Somebody's going to pay you a lot of money to make this ether. I don't think they would in reality, but you never know. Anyhow, it says identify a bond in the target molecule that can be made using a reaction that you know, and then draw the substrate in the nucleophile that would be necessary for the reaction. So you can probably see right away that you can make a disconnect right here. Because we saw many, many times um, in previous lectures and in this book that NaOET can be used as a nucleophile. And NaOET is just another way of saying sodium ethoxide. So if I draw that out, so I have my sodium cation, and then my ethoxide looks like this. And you can see clearly how this would be a great nucleophile if I could have an electrophile that had the one, two, three, four, five carbons. So if you look down here at the bottom, it says, okay, well, if I start with, you know, one bromopentane, so this is one bromopentane, and I treat that with sodium ethoxide, well, let's think about it. I have a primary alkyl halide, the one bromopentane. I'm treating that with a strong nucleophile, strong base, but it's primary. So I should get the SN2 product. So it says um, I could make it this way by making the disconnect and using this alkoxide here, but this alkoxide's got kind of a long tail attached to it. So that's going to be a little bit more hindered. Anyhow, you'll find that when thinking backwards this way, more than one reaction will often come to mind. And you're going to see that more and more as the class progresses, that oftentimes um, a problem will have more than one acceptable solution. And that's perfectly fine. So going back to what I proposed, if we were to take this primary um, alkyl halide, this one bromopentane and treat that with sodium methoxide. It's a strong unhindered nucleophile. It's good for SN2. I have a primary halide. That's a very good substrate for SN2. So yeah, we expected this reaction would work. So if you wanted to draw that out, you would put the substrate. So here's our substrate. We put our nucleophile on the top. And then I have also put a solvent here. So this is DMSO, which is DMS, or sorry, dimethyl sulfoxide, which is a um, a polar aprotic solvent. So it says at the bottom here, we are trying to do an SN2 reaction, so we might as well use an aprotic solvent, right? So if you had chosen a different polar aprotic solvent, like let's say you put acetone or something uh, else that we was in our slides, I would accept that as well. That would be perfectly fine. But overall, what you can see here is that organic synthesis is really powerful and that we were able to take an alkyl halide and we were able to make an ether from it. So we were able to make a brand new functional group. So let's take a look at this question here. It says, um, what reactants would you need in order to make the following compound as the product of a substitution reaction? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is covered in detail in the Skill Builder 7.8. But basically, what the conclusion that they came to is if I cut, sorry, if I cut this bond here, and I put my retrosynthetic arrow, well, you might remember the nucleophile that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide, or sorry, this slide presentation, which was the acetate ion. So if I take acetate, and I was to treat that with ethyl bromide, so if I treated that with ethyl bromide, right, that should give me the desired product this um, this uh, ester. So this would give me my desired product. So in order to write that out, if I wanted to write out the reaction, I would write out my sodium acetate, just like was in the, in the first slide in this presentation. So I'd put my sodium acetate, and I would put my substrate on the top, like this. And I could choose a solvent for the, for the SN2 reaction that's taking place here. I'll choose, I'll choose acetone, just for fun. So I'll choose acetone, and I end up with this product, which has a name. Um, we haven't done ester nomenclature yet, but this is called ethyl acetate. Anyhow, um, so this is the kind of strategy you want to take when you're doing um, uh, s synthesis in Chapter 7 and, be and beyond in Chapter 8 and Chapter 9 and in Chapter 10 and Chapter 11. So if I could give you one bit of advice about organic synthesis in Chemistry 3101, it would be to do all the practice problems that you can get your hands on. Because the more practice problems you do, the, the more abundantly clear the answers become as you progress in your study of organic chemistry.